rest of the time this morning, I want to open the Word of God up and uh, continue to speak about um, reaching the lost, uh, which is uh, something that Pastor Andy started speaking about last week when he talked about lifestyle evangelism. So if you've got your Bibles with you, then grab them. Um, we're going to read from Luke chapter 10, first of all, in just a few moments. Um, but just to set the, set the foundation of what I want to share this morning. Uh, last week, we were challenged by Pastor Andy to be witnesses of Jesus to people in our lives. He talked about how to initiate conversations with people um, so that um, we can bring the good news, the gospel, into the conversation. And one of the great ways to do that is, is to simply ask the question, who do you think Jesus was? Or who do you think Jesus is? And, um, you know, some people... Uh, will be taken by surprise by that question, but it will lead to a good conversation. And um, there might be even people here this afternoon who are here because someone asked you that question this week. Who do you think Jesus was? And, um, and what Pastor Andy said last week was that we can all be witnesses of Jesus because to be a witness of Jesus doesn't involve us understanding deep Christian theology. It simply un it involves us understanding who Jesus is in our lives and talking about what Jesus has done in our lives. Um, and, and no one can take that away from you because it's personal experience of who he is. So, so last week, Pastor Andy talked about the how. How do we open up these conversations? How do we be evangelists in our world? And today, I just want to ask um, the question, who should we be evangelizing to? Who should we be bringing the good news of Jesus to? And um, so if you want a title for what I'm talking about today, it's simply this, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? So Luke chapter 10, I believe we find an answer to this question here. So verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with your soul, with your strength, and with all of your mind down the road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, took care of him. On, on the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Now, I find that passage really challenging. And um, that passage answers this question, who is my neighbor? This, this expert in the Jewish law asked this question because he wanted to, I think, probably justify uh, why he only uh, you know, showed love to certain people, perhaps, in his life. He had an idea of what his neighbor was. And Jesus, of course, um, then gives an answer. You know, who am I expected to love? Who am I expected to love just as I love God? Who should I be showing this love to? And Jesus said, well, everyone in your world who has need. Everyone in your world who has need. And, and specifically, he gave the example of a man who was broken, bruised, uh, lying at the side of the road, dying. And so if there is anyone in our lives who has the need to be saved, rescued, brought from brokenness to wholeness, then we have a responsibility towards them, don't we? So a person isn't your neighbor because they live next door to you or because they're from the same culture. They're your neighbor because they're positioned in your life in some way. And we all have unique worlds. My world is different to your world. It involves a lot of the same people a lot of the time because of, of the church family. But I believe there's people that are positioned in our lives that are unique to each one of us that we then have the responsibility to reach out to. 
people that are broken, people that are lost and dying, that we have the responsibility to reach out to you. Now, religion, what religion does, when all we have religion, our eyes are closed to the need of others. Um, Perhaps those on our path, the path of life, who are broken. Two religious people walked past this man who was dying at the side of the road. They were too busy doing things for God that they'd lost the heart of love and compassion for people in their world. So this priest and Levite, they, they, they walked by. It was too inconvenient to reach out to the man. Perhaps they were going to get their hands dirty. They didn't want to get their hands dirty. Perhaps it would have taken too much time out of their busy schedule doing things for God. Perhaps the man needed too much cleaning up. It was beyond their abilities, so they thought. Perhaps it would have cost them too much. So they passed by on the other side of the road. But then the Samaritan comes along. And don't forget, Samaritans were considered a much lower class of people by the Jewish people. So a very unexpected person comes along and reaches out to this man who was at the side of the road, bleeding and dying. He reaches out to him with love and and compassion. The Samaritan carried the heart of God, and he was moved with compassion for this man. That's what caused him to stop and help, because he had a heart that was filled with God's love. And we were singing that song just now, um, Build My Life, and, and there's that part that talks about our hearts being filled with God's heart, so that we can go out to those in our worlds with God's love. And that's so important, because actually what will cause us to stop and see the need of others, and to reach out to people is when our hearts are filled with the love and the compassion of God. Amen? Okay. So this is why Jesus would constantly stop to bring healing to people. Jesus stopped whenever he saw need because his heart was moved with compassion. Every time Jesus did a miracle, it started with his heart being moved with compassion for those that he saw who were broken and lost. And our desire to help other people comes from a heart that is filled with the love of God. So we have to have a personal revelation, a a true understanding in our hearts of God's great love for us. And when we do, we will love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength and with all of our mind. And we will love others as we love ourselves. Amen? So... That's why the Samaritan stopped and helped this man. In fact, I think his heart was so filled with love and compassion that he couldn't pass by. And I'd like my life to be that way, that I'm, my, my heart and my life is so filled with the love and the compassion of God that I can't pass by the need of others. You might be thinking, well, I don't really have anyone in my life who is broken like that man that was lying at the side of the road. Well, two things there. First of all, um, you'd be surprised what needs people have. Um, There are probably people in your world who have been beaten up by life or, or just by this world. And just because people don't have external bruises and will talk about their needs all the time, actually, there are some very wounded people in our lives. And God wants us to reach out to those people. He wants us, those who have found Jesus, those who have been made whole by God, um, he wants us to reach out to people in our world, help them in practical ways. But also, of course, what we're talking about isn't just a, a, a state of natural brokenness, perhaps a physical or mental or emotional need that people have in our lives, but actually we're talking about spiritual brokenness because everyone, if they haven't received Christ and made their peace with God by believing in Jesus, then they're in a place of spiritual brokenness. And by far, that is the greatest need that any human being has. Beyond any natural needs that we have, our greatest need was to find Jesus, to be made whole spiritually, and to, uh, to find right standing with God, and therefore wholeness with God. So this is truly the greatest need. So whether there's signs of of outward brokenness or not, there's many people in our worlds who need saving, rescuing, healing from sin and death. Right? So the Samaritan stopped. And this is what he did. He poured oil and wine on the wounds of this man. And he wrapped him in bandages. 
And then he took him and placed him on his animal. I guess it was probably a donkey. And um, he, he took him to the inn. And when he took him to the inn, he paid the innkeeper to look after him. So he invested his own resources into the man. And I think um, that picture of how the Samaritan helps that man in a very practical way, I think that picture is very true of what our responsibility is as believers to those who are in this state of spiritual brokenness, those that God's called us to go and reach and go and share the love of Jesus with. So oil and wine, it represents the Holy Spirit. And I think it just speaks of us taking God's Spirit, the life of God, to other people and wrapping them up, soaking them in the Holy Spirit. We can only do that when we're filled with the Spirit ourselves. Amen? And that's why in Acts 1 verse 8, you shall be witnesses to me, you shall receive power, and you shall be witnesses to me. So the power comes from God, doesn't it? The power comes from God's Spirit, the ability to be effective in other people's lives. And then the man carried, uh, the Samaritan carried the man to the inn. And that speaks of us bringing people into the house of God. Bringing people into the presence of God. Bringing people into a place where they will be loved and accepted and nurtured and grow in God. And then, of course, um, he invested his own resources. And again... We've been called not just to make converts, not just to preach the gospel to the nations, but actually we've been called by God to make disciples, to bring people into a journey with God and help people grow in their walk with God. And, and so I think what the Samaritan did for that man's physical needs um, paints an amazing picture of what we're called to do for the spiritual needs of people around us, those who are currently lost and perishing. So, like the Samaritan, when we carry the heart of God for people, we're not going to be able to pass people by. We're going to be moved with compassion when we see not just physical needs, but the spiritual need of those around us. And there are many in our lives, um, many in our lives, who are not yet reconciled to God, who have not yet received that spiritual wholeness and healing that comes when you accept Christ as Savior. Now, our compassion towards those who are suffering, emotionally, maybe physically, uh, maybe mentally, when we show compassion to people in that way, often that will open a door to us to preach the gospel to them, to bring Jesus to them. So let's be ready for that as well. Let's not just be people that are good at meeting practical needs. I think that's really important. I think sometimes just by meeting the practical needs of those who live all around us, those in our community, uh, God is glorified by that and people turn to him through that. Um, But actually, let's always be ready and let's always be intentional about bringing Jesus into the lives of those whose practical needs we meet. I mean, we go out, for example, we go out uh, and and we visit the homeless uh, Monday and Friday. The van goes out and a team go out. And, um, and we always say to the team, meet the needs, provide the food, provide clothing if it's needed, and, and, and sleeping bags and so on. But actually, um, the greatest need that anyone has that we will meet is that spiritual need, that brokenness that can only be healed by someone finding Jesus. And so, so we should always be ready to have those conversations, always sensitive, always wise, Um, Not pushy, but at the same time, always ready to have those conversations that will lead people to the knowledge of God. Amen? So, very often, Jesus would stop, and he would meet a physical need or a practical need, or he'd speak into um, the emotional needs of a person, and that would would, would show the mercy of God upon that person. The the love and the, the goodness of God would be shown in their lives And they'd be open then to receive the message of truth. And and that's a great way. If Jesus did it, then we should do that too, right? So we've got to always be intentional about bringing the gospel to people. And the last thing about the man who was helped by the Good Samaritan was that he recognized his need to be saved. He was badly beaten up. He was half dead, it says in, in the text that I just read. And he was so lost and dying that he was very open to being helped. 
Uh, and that can be very helpful when people's hearts are very open to being helped, can't it? Um, he wasn't rejecting the Samaritan, saying, go away, I'm not interested. He was saying, yes, please help me. Um, <clears throat> there will always be people in our worlds who don't recognize their need uh, for their spiritual brokenness um, to be healed, their need to be saved. There will always be people in our lives like that. And Jesus said something about this in Mark chapter 2. So let's just turn to Mark 2, verses 13 to 17. It says this. Now it happened, as he was dining in Levi's house, that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it? That he eats with tax collectors and sinners. They were thoroughly disgusted with Jesus for hanging out with the tax collectors and sinners. When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. In other words, Pharisees, you don't recognize your need for salvation, but these guys do. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And it's interesting, isn't it, that there are people, there are many people in our worlds who um, are in a state of spiritual brokenness, who are lost and dying. They're perishing. And they don't recognize their need. Uh, and maybe because things are all going well in this world, you know, physically and emotionally uh, and, and naturally speaking, everything's sorted. Maybe it's harder to recognize the internal need that you have for Jesus. But um, they're alongside those who don't recognize their need, there will always be those who do. What's the best thing to do for those that don't recognize their need for salvation? Pray for them. Pray for them. Pray that any hardness of heart, that the Holy Spirit will come and soften their hearts. That is sometimes all we can do for people. Because, I mean, you and I both know that sometimes you can have conversation after conversation with someone about Jesus and they are completely shut down to Jesus and to who he is and to what Jesus wants to do in their lives. But as we pray and as we keep praying, then hearts will be softened. And I believe that with all of my heart. Amen? So, so should we just then write people off and say, well, I think they're going to be hard-hearted, so I won't bother sharing Jesus with them. Well, no. Uh, we should always uh, never judge the hearts of people before we've, we've in- attempted to share the gospel. But also, um, when they clearly are shut down to what we're sharing, then we, we change our strategy and we pray for them. We still look for opportunities to share, but we pray for them. I think also we need to be careful not to get so caught up with catching one specific fish, so a soul is a fish, right, that, that we miss out on the great multitude of fish that we could be catching um, if we're sensitive to, to God's leading. And I base this on a simple verse from John 21, verse 6, which says this. And he said to them, Jesus said to his disciples, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some, find some fish. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. That's interesting, isn't it? So they changed their strategy based on what Jesus spoke to them. And in the same way, we have to be people who are sensitive to God's leading. Sometimes we can spend all our time and energy on one person And then there's fish that are swimming by our lives that we're missing. And maybe God actually wants us to turn around and reach some of those fish because they're going to be more open and softer-hearted towards what we're saying. And actually, maybe when we do that, someone else comes along and this one fish that we've been focusing on for such a long time, they come and get them in their net. I've seen that happen so many times. Um, So actually, let's be um, led by the Spirit of God when it comes to our witness. Let's, let's never pass people by. Let's never be a people that are too busy doing things for God that we forget that actually um, there's people that have great need. But at the same time, let's always be sensitive to the strategy that God has. I think I just said that much better than I did in the first service. So we're going to use this recording this week. Um, and um, 
But it all comes back to this, doesn't it? Let's be people whose hearts are filled with God's compassion. So filled with God's compassion and love that we notice people in our lives. That we notice people that are in our world who are spiritually broken. And and we stop and we help them. Amen. That's the challenge. Who is my neighbor? Everyone in your life who has need. Everyone in your life who, who, who is in a state of brokenness, whether that is physical or spiritual. Let's be people that are aware of that and reaching those people. Praise God.